five minutes. Okay. We are live. Good. Maybe Petra, you have a go. Uh, yes. <laughs> Our, I just got a message that someone of us has technical problems, so therefore I apologize. Like it seems like we we had it yesterday, Marianne. Um, so you have to decide who wants to start. So I think um, we only have like four minutes, so it's really short. Uh, I'll take just my one minute. Uh, my name is Dan Asher. I'm an activist. I'm a social change maker. I'm an Ashoka fellow. I'm based in Geneva, Switzerland. And um, I think this whole discussion about, you know, whether, whether, and it's a question of whether art can change the world. And I turn this around and I say art changes the world. And I think that's a very important aspect of art. Uh, in the past, you know, art has always been a catalyst for uh, change and social change. Um, a lot of artists don't want to use this, um, you know, this stamp of a social change maker, but that's um, something that I fully embrace. I'm, I am a social change maker and I'm a Ashka fellow, which is a social entrepreneur as well. And uh, my art is specifically aimed at creating change. So I'm the founder of Happy City Lab and we're doing projects all over the world and just this year, um, my artwork will be traveling in over 20 countries. Um, and these two artworks that are specifically, specifically turning uh, doing on two at the moment are more aimed at climate change. And the idea is always to create situations where strangers come and connect beyond the differences and where we plant seeds on, you know, questions about our global future and our shared humanity. So to me, there's no question whether, you know, art can change the world, art has changed the world, will keep changing the world. And I think that's the profound goal of uh, art, whether it's from within or it's, you know, towards the, the outside world. That'd be my one minute. <laughs> no, and then what I really like on your art is that is somehow in public, you know, it's accessible for everybody because uh, there are still barriers in the art world. I know that's from a lot of collectors, are having access to the art world and you make it more liberal because everybody has access to it. And this is why I like it a lot. I have experienced it like in a very small country, even smaller than Switzerland and Luxembourg, where they have a very impressive museum. And additionally, they, may, they are making to making their um, museum still very attractive outside exhibitions with photo works. And so far, this for me is also very unique because um, you're not pushed always to go in, in the established institutions. You have art accessible all over the world. I mean, this is a difference and perhaps it makes it more accessible for a lot of people all over the world who are not uh, in this art world already. You know? Yeah, I think art needs to go towards the people as well. You're right. Um, maybe Michael or... Marianne, do you want to take over? Yes, Michael, I think it's now your turn. <laughs> you can't avoid it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, hello, I'm Michael Hendricks. I'm the Global Design Director at Design and Innovation Consultancy, IDEO. I'm also a professor of music business at Berkeley College of Music. Um, and I'm the co-author of a book called Two Beats Ahead, What Musical Minds Teach Us About Innovation. Um, what I'm most interested in and why I pursue these things as my career is unlocking the creative capacity of individuals. I truly believe that um, art, which, which is one expression of human creativity, is on the forefront of what we understand as society as um, creative expression. But every, every human has the capacity to be creative and more often than not, we've created structures in our society that discourage it. So what I want to do as a creator, um, as a designer, as a musician, is help unlock the creativity of others um, to pursue uh, those parts of themselves which do reveal more of the world to us. And so uh, just a quick example to think about. Um, I was actually talking to Petra as we were uh, waiting in the, in the green room, so to speak, um, about how the pandemic has been a pause moment for the world. And 
many of us um, were just forced to change the way we lived, forced to disrupt um, our routines. And because of that, we're able to begin to reflect on what seemed necessary or essential, what seemed just or unjust, what seemed um, edifying or destructive. And because we had such a long pause, and in fact, many of us are still in it, um, we were able to begin to see things that artists have been pointing out to us for decades. <laughs> um, so for example, it's a few artists. I, I would say someone like Ginny Holzer, who has been pointing out for years about the abuse of power um, in our social systems through her art. Um, or someone like Barbara Kruger, who has been a, a critic of uh, pop culture itself um, and holding the mirror back to us. These are artists that have been at work since the late 70s. Um, and now, if you look at the messages that people are starting to communicate um, in the world about what we value, you see that these artists were actually on the forefront of sh holding this up to us for years, whether it was about environmental concerns or um, patriarchal systems or unjust societies. We have these artists have been pointing these out. Musicians have been the same. Um, whether it's someone like uh, Tom York from Radiohead, who has been for the last two decades, <laughs> been calling out climate change as, as a urgent issue, or someone like Jeff Tweedy from the American Ben Wilco who has been talking about the Black Lives Matter movement and um, trying to bring empathy into that. Um, these artists are not special, but they have been in our conscience and they've been are mirrors of humanity. And my hope is that more people begin to recognize that they have the capacity to see the world as artists. Because if they do, I believe a lot of the change that does get perpetuated to Dan's point can be accelerated. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Thank mm. you. <laughs> no, but this is, um, this is definitely the point, you know. But this means we have to make also art more accessible uh, for the world, you know. Still, there are only, I mean, if you see sometimes um, the numbers of visitors in museums is still a small number. And this is why I like your approach then um, going outside, you know, presenting art of a museum. And this is perhaps... Um, the, the, the right time for it to think about on new ways presenting art and um, and bring people together. Perhaps this is one of the key messages um, of art of the different kind of arts uh, to to connect people, especially after all these shutdowns. I mean, so many people we know a lot of people who are really got very um, isolated. And um, art is now the place bringing also people together. And uh, with, um, with uh, their um, yes, trendsetter attitude, um, I think they see also new ways connecting us uh, faster. And as you said, Mariana, also introducing new technologies, you know, mm -hmm. in, into our different ways of world. Mm -hmm. I do think, sorry. Please, please, please. I could, I could no. speak for us about my work, but I think, you know, Marianne wasn't live before, so, you know, we should really let her, you know, be present on this call. Yeah, I'll just make a small resume. So I'm an art historian and curator, and I've been working in kinds of fields um, from, well, as I said, curating also to art funding. So I'm very familiar with the field um, and also with singular artists in that sense. And I, I do think... Um, the, this uh, different kind of eye. This has. Uh, this is. Um, this is what distinguishes artists and who might look at things in a different way than we usually do because it doesn't. It doesn't have. It's more like a research. I. I very often feel it doesn't have to be so aim driven, but a perpetuous research. And I think we see it in the new media, the application of new media, how far advanced artists usually are. When we look works at works from the 60s, it's amazing what they felt and what they found out. So I do think they have a look into the future and they just consecrate time to analyze what is happening around us. Mm -hmm. And I think that's always, uh, always been 
the case. But I agree with what now everybody sort of has also uttered. I do think that um, there is a big difference between artists as artists and the art field itself. I do feel the art field, art, art field is very exclusive. Yeah. It still doesn't give access to many people. I found out that we don't know. There is no research about the non-audience. I mean, not everybody goes to a museum. So we only know about the people who go to the museum and usually they are privileged. Mm -hmm. So I think to bring also artists together, let's say with uh, politicians, some countries do that. They make very systematic meetings between artists and and uh, politicians. Or also you can introduce artists to industry and to have a different look on things. So I think it's been a tendency, maybe societal tendency, to look at the art separate. But as soon as you look at the results uh, of the art, it is never separate from society. Then? Totally agree. And um, so my whole work is not to go outside in the city and to use the city as a playground. Um, to offer a new vision of the city, of the cityscape, and to open the field of possibilities so that people can see you know, their own space as a possibility for other things and uh, different ways to use it and um, different you know, possible futures. Um, I already seen the impact of my work on police policies and politicians. So politicians, you know, coming up and say, yeah, we want to do this, and then but my work is, you know, out onto the streets and we have to remove the idea of everything being controlled and secured. And, um, and you know, most of the time people say, no, oh, that's never going to work in our city because, you know, people will do this and that and that. I say, yeah, but it's an experiment and let's try it and we'll see what happens. And because I bring this idea of an experiment, um, you know, and we present it this way, say, oh, okay, you know, it's just for a little time. You know, if it works, I get all the credit, of course, that's the politician. Or um, um, if it doesn't work, we say, oh, it was just a little money and, you know, we give it a try and it didn't work and we can move on. And, you know, most of the time it does work because you, if you can actually create a situation where the, the population uh, has to engage and understand that by engaging with the art, uh, they can, you know, make their communities better, they actually do engage and, and engage in a really, really good way. Um, so I feel there's a change of paradigm as well there. So first is, you know, the art thing outside of the museum and art galleries, I think both you know, have to live side by side, but like, I think, you know, art has so much to offer to the world. So, you know, why not bring it out onto the world? And, um, and also, you know, having art in the city, but that, you know, touches the citizens and goes towards them and maybe the citizen having a way to play with it, you know, to touch it, to move it, to be involved and to change it. Um, participative artworks or artwork that is created with the population that has a huge potential and a huge power to it. And Michael, what is your proposal? Well, I'm very interested in the broad definition of art and this plays it applies to mass media. So mm -hmm. that's one reason I speak about musicians as well as visual artists because I believe in the digital era, the blending of technologies creates blending of expressions. And it's almost impossible today to look at any art form and categorize it in a, in a simple category. Oh, oh, that's music or that's painting or that's visual art or that's sculpture, just simply because we are blending all of our tools and because we're blending all of our tools, we are creating integrated artworks. So the huge advantage of that in the digital era is the proliferation of ideas on mass scale. You know, I mean, the fact that you can have millions of people singing the same song is still fascinating to me. And it's um, in many ways, um, you could point back to someone like Andy Warhol, who said, I'm going to take advantage of an, uh, what we understand about mass production, industrialization, and I'm going to find a way to scale that. You know, in a digital era, we all have access to be uh, working from the same mentality. So my interest in that case is just to continue to press um, in a broader embracing of art. And I think Mariana uh, pointed this out about the art fields tends to still be quite exclusive. I um, but there are, um, I think, movements happening outside of the art field that are art movements that, you know, eventually the art field will acknowledge. Um, and a lot of that seems to be in the, in the blend of digital art or music, et cetera, that I think are continuing to have a huge social impact right now. Mm -hmm. 
And perhaps the art world should a little bit prepared if another shutdown, whenever um, is happening, uh, how to continue with your business. Because what I've noticed, a lot of artists all over the world really suffered from all the shutdowns. So I think with your art, then you're a little bit more independent on this stuff. But uh, we should be prepared or or should be aware um, how this could be avoided, you know, how we can make our art visible even under these um, special circumstances. Any advice from you, Marianne? Yeah, that's a big that, that's a big question. But I think the visibility is really only one part. I mean, I'm 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 mentioning something which might really feel very boring, but I mean the discussion about artist fees, for instance. You know, it's also a question of economics and why is it that very often everybody is paid except the artist, you know? Right. Uh, it, it's it's um or why is there not the succession law working all over the world? You know, why can auction houses get really big wins even on still living artists? So I think this is like um, making the artist sometimes seem like a different kind of being. So not within the society. So all other rules apply to them. And I think that's not the way it is, first of all. And, and it's not, um, and it's not right i also notice it, it of course this time at least in switzerland everybody was immediately saying about supporting the artists and the cantons and the cities and the federal you know everything was really like but there is still a distinction made between giving subventions to the artists and then if you give it to um the economy so it is like it has like a different tone in it mm -hmm. when you support the industry or the restaurants let's say now in uh like uh, because they have to to reduce their work and if you give uh, money to the art so i think this relationship is something that is challenging us. and this has again something to do that the artists doesn't seem to be looked at by society as as a profession as uh, as such like i know very well known artists who by their income would not be accepted by the insurances as professionals because their income shows something different than actually what they do. So I think this is a bit less interesting in a way as a subject, but I think it's a phenomena. How, how can society look at that? And then to, to really um, be able to show, of course, everybody has to be able to show what you do also during difficult times, but... I have now a question from a guest. Hello, everybody. Hello. Thank you Hi. for accepting me. Hi, Felice. Uh, yes. Um, I you have a question? Yes. Um, but first, I want to say, Hello? Marianne... Uh, Sorry, I can't hello. Hear me? Hello. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, as an artist and art educator, first of all, Marianne, I am so happy to hear your thoughts. It's not a side issue. I think it's a very important issue. A lot of the times, artists elevate the city or the culture, and people flock there. And then, next thing you know, the artist cannot afford to even live in that place, and they have to move and go somewhere else. So, uh, and yet they're not taken uh, seriously as professionals. Um, but what I am wondering is uh, about the, maybe the gap between our generation, by that I mean people who are 40 and over and the young generation, because I have a lot of students um, who don't even leave the house often, uh, and not because of just the pandemic, but they are so digital. So I'm wondering about like how do we bridge this gap? I ch I began to incorporate artworks or assignments that like they are used to. They always ask me, oh, "Do you want it traditional or can I do this digitally?" Um, so I think <laughs> that is uh, we are in this gray area where I am trying to figure out. Um, how much of what I know I should teach them and how much um, I should 
kind of tap into where they are. So um, just if, if you have any experiences or comments on that. Thank you. Who wants I'm, I'm to have, I'll, I'll comment because um, I think that's, it's a bit of what I was referring to earlier about how the digital era has just disrupted all of our systems that we put in place prior. Um, and but if you if you were born after the year two thousand, you don't care about what was disrupted because it's irrelevant to you. <laughs> there was no disruption to you, um, and I and I think a lot of the students are experiencing that now, where they look at the way we do things socially, they look at the, the way these systems are set up, whether it's the art industry, etc., and it just doesn't make any sense to them because it doesn't match the mental models that they now have at digital era. So I, I think we have to embrace that change. Um, we also have to accept that it's going to be very disruptive. Um, I also appreciate uh, Marianne's statements. Um, in again, if you if you listen to Spotify or um, any streaming service, the same topic is being discussed right now about why do the artists get you know a penny per play <laughs> for their songs that they spent tens of thousands of dollars making? Um, does that make any sense? Does that feel like a fair system? Um, and it's because we've often tried to map these old systems into new ways of doing things. Um, and there will have to be um, some effort on our part to actually accept some losses to accept the new reality, I believe, um, but also to embrace the new technologies. I, this is why I think NFTs are so popular, is giving artists an opportunity to bypass every system that already existed and start to set things on their own terms. Um, and I think we'll just see more artists taking advantage of technologies to redefine the terms so that they can be pay paid fairly and, and earn a living wage. Mm -hmm. Dan, what do you think about this topic? So, um, so like, like Maya, Marian said, you know, like, uh, and the, the person who came up, uh, you know, it's a really important topic about, you know, having a way to live from, you know, your work. It is work, I mean, it's your life, you know, you should, you should be able to live from it and not being underpaid, you know, and, and this view of like, you know, the artist being the last one being paid is really, really tricky, especially coming out of this, you know, out, we hope, uh, or this pandemic period where, you know, what sustained us was art, you know, like uh, that we read books, we watched TV shows, we, uh, you know, we listen to music and, you know, and we watch people doing crazy things, you know, on, on YouTube and, you know, creating art, basically. And uh, these guys are the last ones that are getting paid for it, most mm -hmm. of them. Um, and then, you know, we move on and then we go, oh, yeah, institutional workers, you know, they need to be paid and it's really important. They are, you know, like, uh, but uh, art has been sustaining us in the mental realm where, you know, it kind of helped hold us and uh, made us kind of like go through this uh, crisis to some extent. Um, so this is a really important topic. Um, and then I think they, there's some new ways as well to bridge, you know, like the, um, the um, virtual world with, you know, the, the more concrete, you know, like hands touching uh, art. And I think nowadays art really goes both ways. I did like a, um, a massive piece called We Are Watching, which is a 10 story high um, giant flag, and it's the, the world's flag. It's a giant eye made of tens of thousands of uh, faces from people from 119 countries. And so it was a massive campaign. It was like a viral campaign on the internet where people, you know, took selfies, which is a full on, you know, cur current culture, and you know, take a selfie, put a message addressed to the world leaders at the COP25 uh, in the climate change conference uh, in Madrid. And we put all, put, put all these faces on the giant flag and we made it fly close to the, um, to the COP25 building. And that's when there was a way for all these people to be present at, at the COP25 in Madrid and saying like, we are watching you, you know, you have responsibilities that you have to be up to it. So it started as a virtual um, campaign. It got into like a very concrete flag, a giant flag. And then obviously, and there's some people that we said, but then it's, you know, there were pictures in the Guardian and there were, Everybody was taking photos of them with the, the hashtag we are watching. And then you go back into the video virtual space where the message is amplified and it kind of, it's kind of becoming a meme like the we are watching, we are watching you, the, the message and it's taken up by um, extension, the Iberian and the future and all these movements because 
that's a, you know, the, the meme was printed and then the message is really powerful and it's being, you know, back into the virtual world and then back into the real world where the people draw the eye in their hand and are there, I know, are protesting, like, we are watching you. So these two words can come and connect and need to be connected. And um, just yesterday I had a meeting with uh, someone from the government here in Geneva. Um, they wanted me to create something for them for um, a special event about, you know, the future of the city and, and city participation. And I came up with some ideas. I can't tell you what they are now, but like they were you know, quite pushy, you know, like uh, with the questions on the symbol of power and things like that. But that person was quite young. I mean, younger, <laughs> as far as, you know, government employees are. And he said, like, yeah, I'm really interested and I want to do this one, which was the more powerful, you know. And, um, and so, yeah, but are you ready to, to push it into the administration? He said, definitely. And I think the discussion has to be brought into the streets, you know, when this piece is out. But I'm really interested in having this discussion within the administration because then politicians will have to, you know, come up and take sides and say, okay, we are ready to change things, you know, profoundly within the government as well. So, you know, as you said, these new generations are coming up and they, you know, they don't take things for granted as we did because this is the new game, you know, the new world is here. We are the old, you know, the old crew. We're trying to do our best to catch up for being relevant, but, uh, you know, they're just going along and going like, yeah, let's do this and let's do this. And, you know, um, and I think they're much more open to really rethink the whole system that we've ever been before. Um, yes, I would call it they are feeling more self-responsible, you know, and uh, this is what I noticed during the whole pandemic, and uh, I think artists, or a lot of them I know, are a very good example to feel self-responsible, you know, they're feeling or they felt like an entrepreneur, they created new ideas, even when the gallery, their galleries were closed, they found ideas. They were not just thinking about it, they just made it. And uh, this is what you were just, just describing, I, I think. And it's, it's a new generation. They are not considering the positive, negative aspects and doing a lot of market research. They are just doing it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that is quite important for us now and for the future, trying new ways. You know, Otherwise, we will stick uh, in the future as well in, in old old ways of thinking and uh, we have to create somehow a new world mm -hmm. and getting involved all the artists. I think Marianne, you want, this is your topic. Okay. <laughs> well, I think this is not so new. Yeah. I mean, I just would like, let's, let's, let's think well, about the off spaces, artist run spaces from the sixties on and then especially during the eighties in London, I mean, that's where things were really happening. It was yeah. thriving. And that was initiatives like, why do should I wait until a curator discovers me? You know, that could happen or not. And maybe then I'm like uh, 70, you know, <laughs> the, the way the institutions uh, worked. And then the off spaces came and then a lot more of art spaces, institutional art spaces followed, developed. I mean, in Switzerland, it's amazing how many also Kunsthalles have been created. And I think that was also inspired by that. But what I think is interesting, what does that mean if, if then all of a sudden there is some system just clicking back into a certain a certain method, a certain way, you know, how, how can you keep it like fresh and alternative? I think it is the most difficult thing to remain alternative and not to be taken in by a very, very strong art system, by very strong institutions. And, and that's what I really think it's just a pity because these things, I, I'm very curious to see it now, whether all this NFT world and, and everything, if it's going to be shaped by artists. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be wonderful if there was a place which is much more shaped by artists. But I'm very curious to see it, um, whether this is going to be a really different kind of development. Um, but that's why I really feel the question is really the... The audience, not in the traditional sense, but the way we have discussed it here, like just people, people on the street who will not walk into institutions. What does that mean for art? Because a lot of the 
requirements that artists have today cannot be fulfilled by museums. It's impossible no. how, how they work. So, I mean, this is, I'm very, very curious how, how it's going to happen now in the next couple of years, because there is a potential here that things change. Yeah. So, um, so Chile, I agree with you, you know, so many, I mean, it's been going on, you know, like people have always pushed boundaries and personally, um, I came from, you know, like the, the squats. Of course, you know, Geneva. You know, Geneva is, is quite in capital of Europe, <laughs> kind of, but um, that gave us, you know, such a chance and opportunity to try out things, you know, it was really amazing and, and it created a lot of, a lot of us here. But um, um, like um, Michael said, you know, one thing that is really different today is the the possibilities to reach out to so many people. You know, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the reach of the work has increased, you know, a thousand fold. It's, it's huge and that has never been before. And I agree with you, I'm really interested in um, everything that is related to blockchain, you know, and to see where it's going, you know, because it's being built right now and we'll see what happens with it. Um, there's some interesting things happening, but uh, the, I think the main change mm -hmm. that has already in place right now is to reach, which, uh, you know, artists didn't have before, potential yeah. reach. We have now only two minutes left. <laughs> and I'd like to ask you, each of your three, uh, giving it an advice to the audience, what they can expect from the art world and how they could cooperate in a way, you know? <laughs> Marianne? Well, I think they can expect everything from the art world. They can always expect like somebody's looking at things in a different way because mm -hmm. these people take time to look at things, you know, to look at the world, to to try and not have the aim already and the result ready. So and digitally, of course, um, there is a bigger access, definitely also for people who would not go to a museum or even a film festival. I mean, digitally, you can. You can do that now. Michael? I'll say art challenges norms, and those norms can be broadly defined. Um, and so be, you're going to be inconvenienced by that. <laughs> um, and you have to recognize that art is inconvenient, um, yeah. but still worth embracing because of its inconvenience, because change is hard. So, you know, the, the desire to edit, the desire to control, you have to let that go. Then. I just said that, um, you know, change is here, change is happening, there's no way out of it. Um, you know, look out for what artists will have to say and the possible futures they're pointing out, whether, you know, good futures or, you know, dystopies. Um, it's really interesting to see and being really at, being attentive to, you know, this future people point to and uh, get inspired by it in a good way. <laughs> Sorry. So, thank you so much. Thank you, dear audience. And um, yes, I think it's now. Ah, there's another question arising, a last one. Hello? No. Just a comment. Just a comment. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, thank you very much, everybody. And um, yes, I hope we will still stay in contact. And dear audience, whenever you have a question, um, don't hesitate to get in contact with us. I hope you are available as well for the audience uh, when they approach you to get further information. Thank you very much for all your impressive aspects to this wonderful topic. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.